Welcome to Should I Read It? Should I Read It is a weekly podcast that takes a deep dive into books. I'll provide a summary of the book and tell you how the ideas in the book relate across all the books we've covered so far. In this episode of Should I Read It, we're going to look at Connected. Connected is about the network of friends around us, not just social media. When I purchased this book, I read the title and the subtitle and figured it was just about Twitter and Facebook and those type of social networks. While they certainly appear, the book Connected by Nicholas A. Christakis and James H. Fowler is not a book solely about technology. It's a book about the relationships around us and how those connections work. Here's a quote that encapsulates their purpose. This book focuses on our ties to others and how they affect emotions, sex, health, politics, money, evolution, and technology. But most of all, it is about what makes us uniquely human. To know who we are, we must understand how we are connected. While there is a fair bit of repetition in the book, the authors are using some basic principles throughout each chapter. They use the chapters to show you how these basic principles apply to different types of networks. They cover politics, your influence on those around you, how those around you influence you, and a number of other fields. Let's start by defining some of the core findings and terms before we dive into what they mean in the different areas covered by the authors. The first concept we need to cover is the two fundamental aspects of any social network, connection and contagion. Here's a quote from the book. First, there is connection, which has to do with who is connected to whom. Now, this means this is your relationship with those around you. Not just your family, but any relationship, including the one you have with your barista. But a network is not just a collection of people. According to the authors, it must contain one more thing to actually be a network. It must contain connection. Here's a quote from them. While a network, like a group, is a collection of people, it includes something more, a specific set of connections between people in the group. These ties and the particular pattern of these ties are often more important than the individual people themselves. They allow groups to do things that a disconnected collection of individuals cannot. The ties explain why the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and the specific pattern of the ties is crucial to understanding how networks function. Most of the rest of the book examines how our connections and our place in the network affects those around us. Are we loosely connected on the outside of a network? Then we might commit suicide and detach from the network. But at the same time, we might infect, and we'll talk about contagion in a second, we'll infect others that we are connected to with suicide and spread it. As we left the network, we made those few we were connected to that were also on the fringe already, they were even less connected now. They're more on that fringe of the network. Now, the second one, contagion. Here's a quote from them. Second, there is contagion, which pertains to what, if anything, flows across the ties. Many things can flow across the ties that you have. It can be good or bad, from love to STDs. They all work quite similar, as we find out as we keep reading through connection. One example they use to illustrate contagion is a bucket brigade. We could run back and forth along a path to bring water to a fire, but that is very inefficient. The bucket brigade passes buckets along, this is what flows, and thus it can move much more water to the end with much less effort from the group as a whole. Murder can also be a contagion like suicide, which we've already referenced. Here's a quote from Connected. It can either spread in a directed fashion, retaliating against the perpetrators, or in a generalized fashion, harming non-disputants nearby. Either way, however, a single murder can set off a cascade of killings. Acts of aggression typically diffuse outwards from a starting point, like a bar fight, when one man swings at another who ducks, resulting in a third man getting hit. And soon, in what has become a cliche precisely because it evokes deep-seated notions of unleashed aggression, punches are flying everywhere. To be on proper footing to understand connection and contagion, we need to have at least a cursory grasp of the rules of contagion and connection. Rule one is we shape our network. We make decisions about who we connect with. And we usually connect with people that are similar to us. We also decide how many people we connect with and how we connect with them. We can choose to put ourselves on the outside of a network. Rule number two is our networks shape us. As much as we shape our networks, they shape us. 
If we are loosely connected, having few friends, then we are shaped by that. In fact, we we'll learn later that it's quite possible for us to continue to drift further away as we have no friends because we may suffer depression and thus cut off the contacts we already have. Having lots of friends also shapes us. In that, it can make it much easier to make key connections we need because we have friends of friends of friends that we can reach. This is a three degree rule, which we'll explain in a bit. Rule number three, our friends affect us. This may seem obvious, but our friends affect us. If we sit beside a friend, or really anyone that eats a lot, we are more likely to eat a lot. If a friend quits smoking and we smoke, we are more likely to quit. So if you wanna get in shape, Start building friendships with people that are already in shape or are already working towards fitness. Rule number four, our friends, friends, friends affect us. I'm going to say that one more time for you because it's a little confusing. Our friends, friends, friends also affect us. In that faraway connection that we may not even know, if they gain weight, we are more likely to gain weight. If we are connected to them through many friends, then we are even more likely to gain weight as well. Here's a quote from the book. Our own research has shown that the spread of influence in a social network obeys what we call the three degrees or influence rule. Everything we do or say tends to ripple through our network, having an impact on our friends, one degree, our friends' friends, two degrees, and even our friends' friends' friends, three degrees. Our influence gradually dissipates and ceases to have a noticeable effect on people beyond the social frontier that lies at three degrees of separation. This tendency of things to spread along connection lines is called hyperdyadic spread. Another term that is used in the book and relates specifically to the three degrees of influence rule is the idea that relationships are transitive. If you look it up, the definitions have all these symbols and variables in them. Just think about it like a triangle. A transitive relationship is three things that are related on at least one side, so that they form a triangle. That is, you and two friends that hang out with each other, but not as a group. At least you don't have to hang out as a group. In my life, that's like my friend that we regularly have dinner with and we go hiking with. I also work out with her running coach at CrossFit, but the three of us don't hang out together. That's a transitive relationship. Rule number five is the network has a life of its own. The final rule is that some things in a network can only be understood by studying the network as a whole. You can't understand what's going on if you study one single person or just a few people. You must model the whole network to see what's going on. While it's not officially part of this rule, networks also tend to magnify what is fed into them. Here's a quote from them. It says, social networks, it turns out, tend to magnify whatever they are seated with. This also brings the famous quote to mind. You are the sum of the five people you hang out with most. Knowing the three degree rule, it can also be extended to say that you're also the product of the friends that their friends have. What those friends of friends are feeding into the network is what will get amplified in you. And you'll be amplifying stuff. So make sure it's the things you want to amplify. Next up, a core idea is emotions are nonspecific, but they're fast. We have two main methods of communicating, language and emotions. Emotions show themselves with our body language. A single glance can transmit so much good or bad. Here's a quote from Connected. What emotions lack in specificity compared to oral language, they make up for in speed. You can tell whether your spouse is mad at you very quickly, but having her explain it to you may take a good deal more time. While I don't like the subtle jab that it must be a female that will take a while to express her feelings verbally, but will quickly give you the cold shoulder, this does do a decent job of telling you about the feeling that goes on. The speed at which we instantly feel what others are feeling also helps explain how feelings act as contagens in groups. The whole group can feel tension of a situation without any type of verbal communication or response to it, for good or for ill. Next up, you only care that you're doing better than others is another core principle. This seems insane to me, but most people would rather make 30000 a year knowing that everyone else around them makes 28000 a year than make 36000 knowing that others make thirty eight. Here's a quote from Connected. People assess how well they are doing not so much by how much money they make or how much stuff they consume, but rather by how much they make and consume compared to other people they know. Dave Ramsey is a financial guru, and he has a quote that goes something like this that shows the insanity of this for what it is. His quote is, you purchase things you don't want with money you don't have to impress people you don't even like. We'll see this idea a few times in the book, 
that we almost always gauge our success based off how we think others are doing. If they have a bigger house, we are dissatisfied with our house. Next up is Dunbar's numbers. This is the final big concept you should understand before we dive into the rest of the book. They're actually not introduced till much later in the book than the intro, but we're going to see them a few times so it's good to understand them up front. Here's a definition of Dunbar's numbers right from Wikipedia. It says, Dunbar's number is a suggested cognitive limit to the number of people with whom one can maintain stable social relationships. Relationships in which an individual knows who each person is and how each person relates to every other person. Now, Dunbar actually had three numbers for our groups. First one is 38, which he called the overnight camp. Second one is 148, which is his Bander village. And the third one is 1,155, which he termed the tribe. The key one that we see around most often is 148, and that's for the band of the village. And it's actually usually rounded to 150. Recently, we've even seen research that tells us our new and fancy social networks don't break this number. I have a link to that paper in the show notes. Even in Facebook, we have about 150 real friends. That's people that we can actually keep track of our connection with. There has been much greater variability found in size between the overnight camp and the tribe numbers, and they are much less cited. Most times when someone is citing Dunbar, they're only really talking about the 150 number for the band or the village. With those key concepts under your belt, you're ready to dive into the rest of Connected, where the authors are going to show you how the key concepts work throughout life. First up, when you smile, the world smiles with you. You may think that how we feel is our own thing, that we control it, that we're this black box and it's up to us what goes on inside, but it's totally a lie. Reference the three degree rule. How we feel is greatly influenced by those around us. Wait staff at a restaurant can get a better tip from you if they're smiling at you. Now, that doesn't mean that if we are 4 out of 10 on the happiness scale, we can become a 7. We tend to have a fixed state for a long-term disposition. Here's a quote from Connected. Each of us tends to stay put in a particular long-term disposition. We appear to have a set point for personal happiness that is not easy to change. In fact, like other personality traits, personal happiness appears to be strongly influenced by our genes. This fixed position over the long term is the hedonic treadmill in action. That means it felt good to have so, so much money at first when you got that first raise, but six months in, it's just the normal income. You've adjusted your expectations to that new level of income. Next, we're going to talk about marriage partners. And the fact that you have less choice than you think. Here's a quote from Connected. Because we are so sure of our individual power to make decisions, we lose sight of the extraordinary degree to which our choice of a partner is determined by our surroundings, and in particular, by our social network. I met my wife at camp. I went to camp because I went to a college that was run by the same parent organization as the camp. I went to the college because my chiropractor told me that I'd probably like it, And then he wrote me a reference letter. I met my chiropractor at church. Unsurprisingly, my wife was also a church person, in the same denomination even. Many of our core beliefs are very similar. This should surprise no one. We mostly marry people that are like us. Even as we marry more and more across racial lines, they are still mostly like us. While people increasingly meet their partner online, family is still much more likely to introduce you to your partner. Also, if you're in the center of a network, better connected, then you have more choice of partners. Here's a quote from Connected. Bigger and broader social networks yield more options for partners, facilitate the flow of information about suitable partners via friends of friends, and provide for easier, more efficient, more accurate searching. Hence, they field better partners or spouses in the end. Now, the authors also talked about the benefits of marriage to both partners in a traditional marriage. Here's a quote from them. Being married adds seven years to a man's life and two years to a woman's life. That's better than most medical treatments. They also address the problem of having a spouse die and that when this happens, men die much sooner than women. They suppose that this was because the main benefit that a woman received was the financial and that the main benefit of that stayed around once her husband died through things like insurance. Yes, they did have some research to back this up. The main benefit that a man received was emotional. And this is gone when their spouse dies. Here's a quote from the book. The emotional support spouses provide has numerous biological and psychological benefits. Being near a familiar person, even an acquaintance, 
let alone a spouse, can have effects as diverse as lowering heart rate, improving immune function, and reducing depression. Now, many men don't make broad connections on a deep and emotional level, so they don't have friends to turn to when their spouse dies. They lose the health benefits of a marriage then. At least that's the guess, and I'd love to see more research on this than is more current than Connected, because Connected is almost 10 years old. As Christakis and Fowler talked about marriage, they also brought up the network effect of abstinence pledges. I've seen this go through churches and schools, and my belief was that with more people on board, there would be a better chance of adherence to the stated ideal. But the research says I'm wrong. The key to keeping an abstinence pledge is a special status it confers upon the person taking it. When it's no longer special, it becomes meaningless, and thus people don't stick with it. Now, later in the book, we start to look at some of the less savory things that can get passed around a network. Specifically, we start with STDs. In opposition to most networks that look like a web of connections, most sexual networks are like a ring because of an unacknowledged rule that best friends don't swap partners. Oh, it happens, and many people would deny that this rule exists, but the network research shows that it does. They looked at a school with well above average incidence of STDs, and what they found was that the above rule was broken. Girls would go to parties and offer to have sex with all the boys that were there. Here's a quote from Connected. The more paths that connect you to other people in your network, the more susceptible you are to what flows within it. Because many of these girls were central hubs of connection, STDs spread throughout the entire population of the school with blazing speed. Here's another quote from Connected. In short, when trying to understand the spread of STDs, how and even whether the disease spreads depends on the larger patterns of contact in the overall network. Without information on individuals, partners, partners, and their interconnectedness to other individuals in the population, we cannot determine whether a person is at high risk or low risk of contracting an STD. In fact, the situation is even more complex since ideally, in addition to the structure of the network, the way the ties and overall network structure changes across time should also be taken into account. Now, the big thing that helped stop and roll back the spread of STDs in the school was not some abstinence campaign. It was a campaign to get the rule about not swapping partners back in the mainstream thoughts of the students. This stopped the hubs of connection. As Christakis and Fowler explored STDs, they also explored body image and media. While it's a common assumption that people are heavily influenced by the images they see, this isn't quite supported by the research. Here's a quote from Connected. People see images of ideal body types in the media, but they are less influenced by such images, by this ideology, than they are by the actions and the appearance of the very real people to whom they are actually connected. Now, for us, that means you're much more likely to be influenced by the body shapes and the norms of those around you. Remember the three degree rule here. That your friends, 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 body image will affect your body image. One of the final interesting points as they looked at some of the bad things and contagion was a gender difference in alcohol consumption. My initial assumption would have been that men drinking heavily would strongly influence those around them. It turns out that a woman drinking heavily is a much stronger influence. Here's a quote from Connected. If a woman starts drinking heavily, both her male and female friends are likely to follow suit. But when a man starts drinking more, he has much less effect on either his female friends or his male buddies down at the bar. Now, we're going to start looking at some irrational decisions, specifically bank runs. Have you ever known something was true and yet didn't follow this rational decision through to its end? You followed the lead of someone you knew, even when you knew the decision was poor? This is emotional group contagion at work. Here's a quote from the book. Bank runs are classic examples of how individually rational behavior can lead to communally irrational behavior. We are capable of thinking with our heads, but our hearts keep in touch with the crowd, and sometimes this leads us to disaster. Social networks can make a problem worse because they make it possible for the first people who panics to influence many others, like the couple who decided to withdraw their money once they discovered their friends had taken the money out of the bank. The wisdom of crowds can quickly turn to folly. You also see this effect in the rating of products. If you see a five-star rating of something, you're more likely to give it a five-star rating. Agile project management methods like extreme programming and Scrum, which you've already covered in previous episodes of the podcast, try to combat this tendency with their planning poker ideas for ranking difficulty of tasks. Everyone around the table pulls out their card with a difficulty ranking on it and places it face down. Then you all flip the cards over at once. If you let someone go first, then you have influence on the ranking of everyone else. This is doubly so when the first person to go has some authority over the rest of the team. 
When we look at money, we also need to acknowledge the political drum that gets banged about trickle-down economics. That is the idea that when you benefit people at the top of the ladder, the benefit drips all the way down to the people lower in the ladder. What the research shows in Connected is that this simply isn't true when it comes to social networks. Here's a quote from Connected. While elites like corporate directors clearly benefit from shaping social networks to suit their needs, it is less clear whether these benefits reach other levels of society. If anything, social networks might be seen as an explanation for why economic inequality continues to rise. The logic is simple. If you are rich, you can attract more friends. And if you have more friends, you can find more ways to become rich. And when it is easier to search and navigate social networks, the positive feedback loop between social connections and success could create a social magnifier that concentrates even more power and wealth in the hands of those who already had it. Now, given that Connected was published almost 10 years ago, one would think that the drum would stop being beaten. Alas, politics is a fickle beast that doesn't adhere to sanity seemingly much of the time. Now, let's take a look at group wisdom. If you were to fair and needed to guess the weight of a huge pumpkin to win a prize, few individual guesses are close to correct. But a funny thing happens when you take all the guesses and average them. It's almost always really, really close. Here's a quote from Connected. Social networks can manifest a kind of intelligence that augments or complements individual intelligence. The way an ant colony is intelligent, even if individual ants are not. Or the way flocks of birds determine where to fly by combining the desires of each bird. Now, we actually see this in Wikipedia as well. It went from a thing that many teachers said should never rear its ugly head as a reference to something that is updated rapidly and accurately many times a day. Now, this is a good way that the sum is better than the whole. Throughout the book, Christakis and Fowler use the term good as a reference about what a network produces. They don't literally mean something that is beneficial to society. They simply reference whatever it is that is produced by the network. It can be that the good produced disadvantages most others in the society. Here's a quote from Connected. But in an increasingly interconnected world, people with many ties may become even better connected, while those with few ties may get left farther and farther behind. As a result, rewards may flow even more toward those in particular locations in social networks. This is the real digital divide. If we want to address this stratification of society, then we need to connect across race, religion, income, and in any other way we can think of. It's only with this type of forced connecting that we can start to see the benefits of networks equalize for everybody. If, in fact, full equalization is our goal. Just putting better technology or books in a school doesn't address the issues of connection that students can make inside of that school. Here's a quote from them. To address differences in education, health, or income, we also must address the personal connections of people we are trying to help. To reduce crime, we need to optimize the kinds of connections potential criminals have. A challenging proposition since we sometimes need to detain the criminals. Any holistic solution must address the connections that can be made and allow students to make connections that increase the positive benefits that can be had. There's actually a few things that I didn't cover in the review. In politics, no, a single vote doesn't matter mathematically. But if you vote, your friends are more likely to vote, and the three-degree rule exerts its force. If you're marketing a political movement, you should be finding influencers that are well-connected in a group and can get others out to vote. Ryan Holiday talked about the same idea in Perennial Seller and gives us some great strategies to connect with the influencers that we want to connect with. Christakis and Fowler also had a whole chapter discussing the early formation of social networks and the tension that is in every network. It's summed up really well in this quote from the book. Do we help our friends or help ourselves? And what are the consequences? Will we look dumb if we help others? Will we look mean if we do not? Is it possible to be nice and survive? And how can we possibly make these decisions when we have many friends in a dancing pattern of shifting alliances and interests. They hypothesize that early on, those who can network better, work together, help the group get more food. Then those genes were more likely to pass on and we became the social creatures we are today. In a few ways, Connected shows its age amongst all the good that is in there. The authors state with certainty that we'll have a central place to manage our social profiles and that we won't have the silos that we clearly currently have. I wonder how they'd update that statement with the current state of social media because it's only going more centralized in search of a business model. Connected wraps up with a reading guide so that you could lead a group through the material. It provides a bunch of great questions to answer amongst the group to dig deeper into their book. This episode of Should I Read It is brought to you by the 8-Week Business Bootcamp. 
If you're looking to get your business back on track, join Bootcamp. There'll be a link for that in the show notes. As always, our final question is, should you read Connected? If you want to dig deeper into the research than I could ever provide in a review, then yeah, you go get Connected and read it. If this is merely an interesting topic to have some cursory knowledge about for you, then you got most of it. Go back, do some extra research on the core topics I highlighted at the beginning, and then move on to do some other reading. It's not that Connected is a poor book in any way, it just may not be the key book that you need to read to take the next step in your life or in your business. Thanks for listening to Should I Read It? To support the show, you can leave me a review in iTunes or a heart or a star in whatever podcast player you use. These help more people find the show. If you want to get more reading done, you should get an Audible membership. If you use curtismichaelca slash recommends slash audible, that will help the production of the show financially. In the next episode of Should I Read It? We'll be digging through The Success Grower by my friend Mark Schinnerer. I did an interview with Mark on the Smart Business Show, and you'll find that in the show notes.